Chris Hamilton with the West Virginia Coal Association, the West Virginia Coal Forum, allowed me to welcome everybody uh, to today's forum, which, uh, which is going to focus on coal exports and what, the, what that level of trade and commerce for the state of West Virginia, uh, actually for, for, for the coal industry in West Virginia, means, means for the uh, state's energy portfolio to this region and, and to the state. Uh, there's a lot of gloom and doom that's, uh, that's looming over the uh, coal industry today as we see uh, the, the industry kind of settle in a statewide uh, uh, period uh, of, of austerity where there's no growth and where there's a lot of layoffs and slowdowns and shutdowns. and We have uh, several thousand miners that are furloughed. A uh, number of our coal-fired generators at West Virginia Coal uh, provides have either closed or announced their closure this year and if I'm not mistaken Bill uh, there's 50 some power plants within our operating tri-state multiple state east of the Mississippi River region that receives shipments of West Virginia coal that are set to close by years in and all that's really having an impact on domestic production which we have seen drop from about 160 million tons of annual production down, Jeff, to 120, 125 last year. And it appears that we're off even a little more uh, <clears throat> this year or over the past six months. So amidst all that gloom and doom, though, there is a little bit of a silver lining in the export market as exports have been growing uh, over the past couple years, I believe they have uh, come close to double over the last five years. And these are U.S. exports. But as you're well aware, and if you're not, West Virginia accounts for about 50% of all U.S. exports. Uh, and a lot of that's metallurgical coal, some steam. Uh, but nonetheless, as we go forward, and as those foreign countries particularly that receive uh, coal from the United States grow and develop and expand their economies. Uh, they will use more and more coal, more and more baseload power to provide uh, their, their electrical and power needs. So we believe that, that that demand on the foreign market, particularly within the Asian markets, will be sustained for some period to, uh, of, of time going, going forward. And hopefully that provides us a little bit of a, of a market opportunity, uh, a little bit of a bridge until we can regain uh, our domestic economies and, and regain the level or quantity of power that was generated to meet those demands that we saw uh, over the past couple of uh, decades. So on the, on the upside is that there's a lot of opportunity going forward on the export because there will be additional coal, there will be additional uh, steel, there will be additional coal-fired units developed. But, but just as we face uh, really fierce competition here domestically, I believe it's safe to say that the competition on the international and for that seaborne coal is, is substantially greater than, than what we find our domestic competitors to be. You know, we're competing with places in foreign destinations, places like Colombia and Indonesia and parts of Australia that, that don't quite have the same level of, of regulation, workplace requirements, human rights, you name it. You know, there's a, there's a disparity. We're going to explore all those, uh, all those issues here uh, over the next couple of hours and have a couple of, uh, of uh, experts with us to, uh, to uh, you know, broach those areas and, and lead that, that discussion. The coal industry, because, because my father worked in the power plant, the coal industry uh, helped my dad support his family for years, for 40 years. Uh, the coal industry put me through college in a way in that, in that I worked at the power plant and, and got, out of, got out of undergraduate school with no debt, well I got out of college altogether, with no debt whatsoever because the coal industry was in West Virginia. So I have a great appreciation of, of, the, of, of where the, what the coal industry has done for this region, what it's done for our state, and what it's done for my family in particular. And the fact of the matter is, is that uh, we, obviously things have changed in the last 40 years. There's a lot more challenges that exist today. 
there's a heightened sense of responsibility that exists today. Uh, and, and so the opportunity to sit and discuss those challenges and to be able to host that at West Liberty University is, is really, a, really an honor. West Virginia has a big stake in the coal industry. And uh, so when, it, when the nation thinks of West Virginia, you know we think of energy, and they always think, number one, of coal. And that's what we are. We've been a coal state, have been for 100 years. And there's no doubt uh, that, that we're going to continue the, to, to produce and be a, a major contributor to both the state's economy, our tax base, and the employment in, in the state of West Virginia in this region. You know, uh, over the last couple of years, coal has been declining in its production. I think we had like 144 million tons done in, in 2009. You're saying it was down about 120, 125 this last year. But even despite that, you know, West Virginia's coal mining industry produ produces about 30,000 direct jobs in West Virginia, and it's about 63,000 indirect jobs and employment opportunities for the people of the state. All of very good wages, benefits, etc. So it does provide a, a significant uh, component of our, our state's overall economy. And uh, in addition to that, it's over 60% of the business taxes paid in West Virginia come from coal, and over $70 million in annual property taxes come from the coal industry. So I, I don't think I have to sit here and preach to the choir to tell you the importance of coal to the West Virginia economy, and particularly the local economies. I think last year, or maybe the, my uh, figures are a, day or, a year or two out of date, but over $200 million in coal severance fund, which 20 more. $24 million goes each and every year into the infrastructure bond fund that helps our water, our sewage, our, our, our roads. You know, so it accounts for uh, 95, 99% of West Virginia's electricity production. So those are huge numbers. I mean, you know, we are in an era where Marcellus gas and oil and gas is getting all the, a lot of the, the top of mind headline news, but at the end of the day, coal is still what's keeping the lights on in this region and in this state. If you look at Marshall County up there right in the neck of the northern panhandle that uh, Jeff talked about, they are the number one coal producing county. We have 28 counties that produce coal in West Virginia. Uh, Marshall did 17.1 million in 2012. Boone County is number two down in the south with 15.7. So that has shifted. And, and that's what he was talking about, how important that is across the state. Here we got uh, some facts that talk about the second leading coal producing state behind the state of Wyoming. Our coal seams will average about five and a half feet thick and uh, out in Wyoming uh, they'll run up to 80 to 100 feet thick. So there's a big difference. There's a big difference in BTUs of course. We are the leading underground coal producing state. We're the leading export state. Half of the coal that leaves the shores of this country comes from West Virginia. Now through June uh, they talked about uh, Dave McKinley's letter talked about the fact that it's impacting exports. And through June, exports are down about 7.5% from the previous year. And they're estimating that this year it'll be about 112 million tons that comes from the United States. And met coal is down about 9%, and steam coal, as of the end of June, is down about 6%. We're exporting more steam coal than we ever have as a country to India and to China, and Mike Zervis will talk about uh, a lot of that, and has forgotten more than I'll ever know about it. Uh, but it's a very, very important component to our industry in keeping us alive and keeping us vibrant. Uh, and that's why we're interested in the ports, we're interested in New Orleans, we're interested in Norfolk, Hampton Roads, and Baltimore, uh, and making sure that they get the kind of improvements that are necessary. And the transportation getting from here to there is also very, very critical. 76% uh, uh, of our, our production is shipped to 26 states across uh, uh, America and 37 foreign countries. And Chris mentioned that there's 58 named, identified so far power plants that use West Virginia coal that are either shut down now or plan to shut down by the end of 2018. I do not know the number of tons that that involves, but when you think about that, that has a huge impact on our domestic market as it uh, regards coal that is origined here in, in West Virginia. Uh, we present, we, we produce with our coal about 40% of the power in Washington and Baltimore area. Now that's where we got all our problems and people say, well, won't you just cut it off? Well, it'd be nice to do that. But uh, they, people up there absolutely do not realize that 
their life and their computers and their hair dryers and their coffee makers depend on a West Virginia coal mine. <coughs> now, 32 million tons we keep here to make our electricity. We don't keep it here. The power plants, 16 baseload plants, use about 32 million tons. The kicker is that we've got to increase that because half of that coal comes from another state. Much of it comes from Ohio, some from Kentucky, some from uh, Virginia, some from Pennsylvania. But we've got to get back to where we get another 16 million tons of our production staying here in West Virginia. Our 16 coal-fired base, baseload coal-fired plants are 86 percent compliant with all the air quality rules that EPA has put out. <coughs> Excuse me. Greenhouse gas is, of course, the killer. And no one has got the ability to do that at the volume or the magnitude that is, is being required or being suggested it's going to be required. The Longview plant in Morgantown is a great example of us being able to do this in West Virginia because it was built here, it's operated here, it uses West Virginia coal, and it's the second cleanest coal burning plant in the world. So we know we can do it here. The, uh, some of the things that Jeff was talking about shows right here. If you go over to 2007 and 8 and compare that to 2011 and 12, the farthest right column, you can see in that period of time we have lost about 36, almost 37 million tons of production. But at the same time, that was invisible to Mike and David and Ron and the guys at the Capitol because at the same time we lost 37 million tons of production, we gained $76 million in severance taxes. So they looking at budget numbers in Charleston have not seen the dramatic impact that this has had. But all of those 37 million tons mean that we don't buy as much equipment, we don't have as many people working, we don't pay as much property tax, and it just uh, crescends to a tremendous impact. So, but the price has been robust, uh, and it's now declining, but that's what causes it to be invisible because severance tax is based on price. So why are we threatened? Well, let me go. I missed one here. Uh, this is another example of what Jeff was talking about uh, and how deeply it reaches into the state because all 55 counties get coal severance taxes. Whether you produce coal or not, I said 28 states produce coal, they get more than the other states because they do produce coal. But you can see the distribution there. 75 percent goes to the ones that do produce coal. And we, it's about $36 million in 2012. And Jeff mentioned this, that the first 20 million, I think, it depends upon the collections, but it goes right straight to the infrastructure revolving fund that goes to the counties to build water and sewer. And then the workers' comp old fund picks up about $70 million out of our severance tax every year, uh, and that's when they privatize that. The bottom, the bottom line right here, property taxes, that's, that's where the real impact comes. These are real dollars that these counties get and depend on. But when you start talking about impacting property taxes, the income taxes, the sales taxes, and the gasoline taxes, that's where it really begins to eat into what we consider to be our standard of living and what you all expect out of state government. And that's why it's so important that we maintain a high level of production. So here's why we're threatened, the economic uncertainty across the world as well as here in America. The, my, the, you know, we had a better winter than we did the year before, but it's still a mild one. The stockpiles remain about 11 percent above the 10-year average, but they're about 12 percent below what they were last year, they tell me, the experts do. And they're going down, but not nearly fast enough. Natural gas, the $2 natural gas you heard so much about, uh, is breaking the gas industry. They can't afford to drill at $2. And they're certainly trying to impact and get into the power plants with the cheap gas. And last, uh, the most recent price I've seen is about three thirty-four, dollars uh, as opposed to $2. And this, the experts tell me we need to get to a, somewhere between $4.50 and $5 to be equivalent at the power plant level as it regards the fuel. A challenging reserve base, there's no question. 
We've been mining coal for 150 years in this state. So you get the thick ones, you get the ones that are closest to the road and the rivers first. And what we have left are the ones that are thinner, uh, more difficult to get to. Causes our, our cost to be up. Uh, the federal government, I can talk for long periods of time about the federal government and what they've done to Appalachia, but more specifically to West Virginia. And the EPA, it's lawsuits, it's the cost of permitting, the delays, the uncertainty that they've created. They vetoed permits in southern West Virginia. They create havoc with people in northern West Virginia by delaying, delaying, and delaying the, the permitting ultimate decision to give people particularly water permits. And, and that uncertainty not only mounts the expense, but it, it just absolutely stymies investment. So, and then MSHA, I can talk about MSHA a little bit and uh, the tremendous impact that they've had. Nothing's more important to our people than safety and everyone going home at the end of the day safely to their families. But MSHA will not approve deep cut permits for underground mines. Has absolutely, it's not the right word to use, but it's absolutely killed our productivity. <coughs> and. Uh, and when you can't get a deep cut permit and this machinery is designed to do this very thing, the ventilation plans are designed to accommodate it, and yet they are forcing us to move our equipment at least twice as much and in some cases three times as much, which is the biggest hazard we have underground. And it's absolutely crippled, absolutely crippled our productivity and caused the price of, of our coal in West Virginia and Appalachia to go through the roof and cause us to fall out of some markets. America has more coal than any other country in the world. And you would think that we would all be pulling on the same wagon trying to use this indigenous resource to put this economy back together. But we here in West Virginia hear about all these things that they're doing in Washington to put the economy back together, yet they're threatening our people's jobs. It makes absolutely no sense to me when you think about how much coal we have and how good our coal miners are who are absolutely the best in the world and the managers and they know how to mine coal in the most difficult of situations and we ought to be absolutely drawing upon that resource and that talent to help put America back together in a secure position. The opportunities that we have, alternative land use, you, many of these are in southern West Virginia, you've heard about mountaintop mining. And, and that's where a lot of these are, but there's some, the city of Weirton, the Pete Dye Golf Course, Milam Park in Morgantown. Uh, and, and this is not the complete list, but this is a full list of many, many accommodations that have been done in the local areas and the counties that have allowed us to move the dirt without expense to anyone else. But we've got a permit in southern West Virginia that they're wanting to complete the King Cole Highway, save the federal government and the state government, tens of millions of dollars and EPA will not approve the permit. They will not approve the permit and it absolutely amazes me when you have the opportunity to put a four-lane highway through Mingo County and the industry will move the dirt at no expense to anyone. But there again EPA stands in the way. <coughs> We're working with agriculture department uh, with the beekeepers. Uh, we've got uh, many opportunities with uh, agriculture that now it's opened up with a commissioner that knows about uh, alternative land use and how good it is to have mine land and use it for agriculture purposes. And his whole point, it's very small and you don't think about it, but one is to get you work with the beekeepers because West Virginia does not produce enough honey to provide the school systems across this state with the honey that they, they require and want. So his intention and goal is to make sure that we can do that here in West Virginia and not have to depend on someone else. So what are we going to do? Best coal miners and managers in the world, we got to keep them. We got to keep them working. You see people, you see the companies, you see Mike Zervos's company, they're shifting people around, trying to accommodate the market. And so they can keep their best people, the ones that will show up every day, they're skilled, they're mature, they're professional and they pass a drug test and they want to keep those so they're moving them from one operation to another to try to accommodate that. We have the best quality coal, no doubt about it, that's why we export half of it from West Virginia. Uh, we've got 53 billion tons remaining in this state according to the geologist in Morgantown and we're located in a pretty good place to the ports, uh, not only in New Orleans but to the East Coast and, and it's simply a matter of what we're used to in this state.
and many people in this state understand the importance of coal and how they depend on it. What we've got to do is convince those that depend on electricity that the, their lives really, really do revolve around whether our coal miners are safe and working. So, and low cost electricity goes without saying we have, a, we have a benefit compared to most. So here's what we want to do. And, and we're going to turn to the legislature, and we're going to turn to the administration and, and get their ideas because they understand now how important it is that they, that we have a robust coal industry and, and with a robust price and keep people working. As I said, we've got to do something to get that 16 million tons of coal that we would like to mine here in our power plants. Uh, continue to beat on the, on the White House and the administration. And, you know, Chris went two weeks ago to uh, Washington with the Democrats to visit with uh, the EPA administrator. And that stuff's got to continue. We've got to keep talking with them in hopes that they're going to see the light one of these days. Congress has got to, got to pile in. I know Dave McKinley's right on the forefront of this, but they've got to put a leash on EPA and MSHA. And they've got to quit. They've got to cause these agencies to quit bullying the states, as they most specifically do here to West Virginia. And we accentuate, as I say, make everyone understand how important we are to their lives without being egotistical or anything else, but point out that a coal miner down here working means that they're going to have the luxuries that they, they're used to. And a half a billion dollars, I ask the business community oftentimes, when we disappear, who's going to pay that money? Which one of you all at the banks or, or at the retail stores and who in this state wants to step up and provide a half a billion dollars to the state revenue? We've got to get back, folks, to a new wealth industry where we're taking something out of the ground and making electricity and steel out of it and putting value added on it. When you look at all the statistics and you look at all the, and you talk about trillions of BTUs and billions of tons of coal and, and uh, millions of dollars in tax revenues, these gigantic numbers, and then, and then you look at the numbers of people that get employed in our state, uh, the great wages and salaries that uh, that the coal generates, the coal generates, and uh, it just go, the list just goes on and on about about how outstanding uh, the coal business has been for the state of West Virginia, not for the past couple years, but for a very very long time. And uh, we're really proud of, of uh, all the accomplishments. And, and, and then to hear the conflict of, of um, the war on coal. Congressman McKinley, uh, Richie mentioned that, uh, that there's a war on coal, and there really is. And, but why should there be? You know, uh, all the statistics, and I'm going to show a, a few more statistics, and you see how the United States is such a powerhouse in energy. When you look at the, the trillions of tons, look at the BTUs, look at the, uh, the even gas with the, with the uh, uh, horizontal drilling capabilities uh, that we're seeing now the days. Uh, you know, I'm here to promote not only coal, but, but energy in general. We have natural gas that's going to contribute to the state of West Virginia uh, way more than we thought it ever would, and I, and I hope that uh, the state benefits from it uh, tremendously. It's, it's, it's another part of our energy portfolio that we should be using in the United States and around the world. I, I mean, uh, if you go to, to Walmart nowadays and look for a pair of jeans, I, I go to any place and look for a pair of jeans, you can't find one that says made in the USA anymore, can you? And why is that? Well, that's because we can't compete. Our, our, um, our costs of labor are a lot higher, aren't they? As an example, I mined coal for 10 years in Columbia, South America, and we, we paid about $10,000 in salary and benefits to the employees there. And that was six times the national average, and, and we had lines that went around the block for people trying to get a job with our company in Columbia, South America. But you saw the statistic today, we're paying close to $70,000 per person in wages in the coal business in the U.S with some outstanding benefits uh, in medical care that we don't really need Obamacare. We've, just, we've got the outstanding wages and benefits that, that we, uh, we, we've always had. But yet, uh, we find it hard to compete in certain things uh, because of, of our high standards of living, 
uh, that's one of the greatest things about living in, living in the United States is that uh, we all benefit from that. But we should be benefiting from, and we're not the way we should, uh, the use of, of, of energy that we have in our country, especially in West Virginia. And there's no reason why we can't work together. Um, we have West, West Liberty University uh, and the foresight from from, from Robin to, uh, to get involved in energy. I, I, applaud, I applaud him for that because when you see the, uh, the natural gas wells growing up around here and you see the tradition we've had uh, in, in our counties here, local counties and coal, there's no reason why we shouldn't be on the forefront of, of, uh, of the advertising of coal. Um, I'm, Bill, I'm going to, how do you do this? Just barely touch it, huh? There it is. Um, you know, anybody ever see this picture anywhere? It's kind of an old picture, but uh, it, it's 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 hilarious, really. But it, it's it's a picture of, of some anti-coal propaganda. Uh, anybody know who put this out? Sierra Club. Who? The Sierra Club. The Sierra Club. Yeah, they were part of it, but who else? Aubrey McClendon. <laughs> exactly. And and who was he with at the time? Jesse. Energy. Chesapeake Energy, <laughs> one of our energy partners, <laughs> trying to get a little uh, a little gain, uh, share of the energy business, right? Uh, I, I call this the scarcity mentality when you have to to um, uh, punish someone else to try to make yourself look good. But, but really, um, across the United States, not just from from uh, a company like this, but across the United States, coal always is getting a it seems it's getting slammed, right? Uh, you read about it every day, and people out in California have no idea what coal miners do. All they know is coal is dangerous and coal is dirty, isn't it? And we know differently around here, but, but uh, around the country, there's a tremendous propaganda campaign against coal. It's called the War on Coal, and it's being funded, and we're having to battle it, and we shouldn't have to be battling it. It's our ticket. Uh, energy is our ticket. And it uh, really just it it frustrates me to uh, to have to listen to it and witness it as a, as a CEO of a company and a, a resident of West Virginia uh, for a long long time. But this is our record in in the coal. And you don't you really don't have to take any notes. I, I'm going to make this presentation available for anyone who would like to have a copy of it. Uh, but but you see the track record we have in in uh, the safety end of the business in terms of being the dangerous business. Over the last four years, if you exclude the explosion at UBB, we've averaged between 19 and 20 fatalities in the business. In 1930, you can see the number, it was uh, close to 1,300 people that died in the uh, coal business. And, and the tremendous gains that, that we've made improving safety every year, year in, year out, the gains we've